You can open your Bibles to Luke chapter 23. Luke 23, if you have children with us tonight, please don't feel awkward or embarrassed or anything else. Uh, if your kids are making noise through the service, okay? Um, that's okay. We love kids, and we're used to having kids in the service, so uh, please don't feel awkward about that. Luke chapter 23, we're going to read verse 32 down through 46 in just a moment. We're going to take part in the Lord's table tonight, and I'd like to look at the account of Christ's crucifixion in the Gospel of Luke. Part of this is simply to prepare our hearts to take part in communion together. To just quickly summarize the events of Passion Week before we get to Luke 23, verse 32. This is Passover, when lambs were sacrificed in commemoration of the very first Passover in Egypt. Number one, God spared all who applied the blood of the lamb to the doorposts from the judgment that he was pouring out upon the Egyptians. It's during this week that Jesus is betrayed by Judas, arrested, and he's tried. He has multiple trials. He has a trial before Pilate, and then he has a trial before Herod, and then he has another trial before Pilate. Jesus is beaten. He's flogged. He's mocked. When the crowds are given an opportunity to see Jesus released, instead of recognizing his innocence and having him released, instead, they call for the release of a murderous insurrectionist called Barabbas instead. Jesus then pronounces divine judgment upon Jerusalem. And of course, then Jesus is crucified. You remember the scene, Jesus is nailed to the cross and there are men on either side of him, one on the left and one on his right, two guilty criminals. Let's read Luke 23, verse 32 through 43. It says, two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of, of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds of our deeds? But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So in verse 42 and 43 of this passage, we see one of the criminals crucified next to Jesus actually believes in him. And clearly it appears that he's saved because Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. This reminds us of a few things. It reminds us that no matter what our background is, no matter the past pattern or degree of sin in our background, no matter how much time we have left on earth, uh, we can be saved. The criminal here next to Jesus on the cross, illustrates all of that. He did not have any good works to speak of. He didn't have any time to show evidence of repentance beyond his words. He would have no opportunity to prove the genuineness of his faith through discipleship. He had mere moments left in his life. But what did he have? In that moment, that criminal crucified next to Jesus was overcome with a fear of God. He says that to the other criminal, do you have no fear of God? In that moment, he's considering the eternal state of his soul. In that fear of God, he recognizes Jesus Christ as the righteous son of God. He saw in Christ the one who had the power over eternity. In that moment, that criminal believed that Jesus was the rightful king over the kingdom of God and that Jesus could save his soul. With this criminal's confession in the last hours of his life, the last moments of his life, this criminal was gloriously saved. This was salvation by the grace of God. 
In fact, God so arranged things in this criminal's life. This is the mercy and grace of God. This criminal who had lived uh, this life victimizing others, uh, breaking the law, incurring judgments. God arranged such a divine appointment in this man's life that in the last moments, the last breaths that he would ever take, there he would be hanging next to the one who could save his soul, and he would be saved. So Luke 23, verse 43, Jesus says to this criminal who has placed his faith in Christ and Christ alone for salvation, Jesus says, truly I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. That's a promise. Truly, that is without a shadow of a doubt, there's no question, and then today you'll be with me in paradise. This is absolute assurance. Absolute assurance to a man who deserved none. He's going to be with Jesus again in heaven that very day. This is absolutely amazing. Sins are forgiven, and he's going to spend an eternity in the presence of God. This is awesome for us this morning or this evening. Some of us, we could maybe relate as we look at our lives before we came to Christ. There are some maybe this, this evening who have not yet come to Christ. And there's something in your mind that says, well, I'm unworthy. He would not accept me. Uh, I've done too much. He's not going to forgive my sin. Uh, none of that thinking stands as we consider the criminal crucified next to Christ. So this is our question for this evening, and hopefully we'll be brief here. Jesus says to the criminal, today you'll be with me in paradise. The question is this, on what basis does Jesus utter those words of absolute assurance? On what basis does he utter those words of absolute assurance? On what basis could he guarantee that this repentant sinner would find himself with Christ in the presence of God in heaven on this very day? Jesus could make these promises because Jesus knew what was about to happen momentarily. In much preaching on the cross, there's a heavy emphasis upon the physical suffering of Jesus. I saw the other day, you can you know, kind of see trending movies on Google TV or wherever. And one of the trending movies was The Passion of the Christ. On one hand, you say, well, it's kind of heartening. People are preparing for Easter, the Passion Week, Good Friday. But on the other hand, we understand that the theology behind such a movie puts such a heavy emphasis upon the physical suffering of Jesus as if in some way through his physical suffering at the hands of men, he was accomplishing something. What we recognize as believers is that there's much more going on at the cross. Yes, Jesus absorbed the hate and the vitriol and the violence of sinful people, and he bore the consequences of their sin. But we also recognize that it was not the physical, of suffer, physical suffering which Jesus bore at the hands of men which made atonement for the world. It was the suffering which Jesus experienced at the hand of God which atoned for our sin. It's this judgment by the Father executed upon Jesus that we see in verse 44. Look at it. As Jesus hung there on the cross, it says, It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus is crucified at the third hour, that's about 9 a.m. It's now the sixth hour, that's about 12 p.m. And our passage says that there's three hours of darkness over the whole land from the 6th to the ninth hour, from 12 to 3 p.m., complete darkness. At a time when the sun would be at its highest and the light and the heat would be its most intense, everything went dark. What's happening here? This is not normal. This is not natural. This is a, a supernatural work of God uh, that he uh, arranged for this perfect time. It's a miraculous work of God because he's communicating something. What is God communicating by the whole world going dark as Jesus is crucified uh, on the cross? He's communicating, number one, that he's present, and number two, that he's present in judgment. Amos 5.18 shows us that such darkness oftentimes communicated from God the ideas of judgment and mourning and woe. Amos 5.18 says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It's darkness and not light. When 
Christ comes in judgment, it's going to be a day of darkness. Joel 3.14 says, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord roars from Zion and utters His voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth quake. But the Lord is a refuge to His people, a stronghold to the people of Israel. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain, and Jerusalem shall be holy, and strangers shall never again pass through it. He's saying there's a day of judgment coming, and when it comes, there's going to be darkness. There's biblical precedence for the idea that darkness is used by God as a signal not only of His presence, but of His coming in judgment. Not only that, but there's even biblical precedence for localized darkness, darkness in one area when it's not in others. And you see that in Exodus uh, during the initial Passover. It's there in Exodus chapter 10 that God pours out a judgment upon the Egyptians. It says in verse 21, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was a pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. And they did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the people of Israel had light where they lived. This is a localized darkness. This is that ninth plague in Egypt. It's a peculiar darkness over the land, a darkness that could be felt. Complete blackout. To the point where the people, it says, could could feel it. They're overcome with a kind of a cold dread. An eerie three days for the people in Egypt where they could see nothing. They could, with that, you could almost... You know, you hear the phrase, you, can, you, could, you could cut the tension with a knife. They understood and, that there was an impending judgment. Because after the ninth plague is the tenth plague. After the ninth plague, there's a tenth plague, which was going to be the death of every firstborn. And it's that final judgment, that tenth plague, which required the Passover. Because judgment was coming over all the land, God instructed the people to take the blood of a lamb and put it on the doorposts. And upon seeing that faith that was required to put that blood on the doorposts, when that death angel passed, it would pass over those homes. Through the death of the lamb, each household would be ransomed from the slavery of Egypt and rescued from that wrath of God. So the first time we see darkness kind of over a localized region like this, God is pouring out His judgment while simultaneously providing a way of escape for those who believed in Him by faith. What is the Father doing as Jesus is on the cross? Darkness descends. Why? Because, well, instead of three days of darkness, there's three hours of darkness. Instead of judgment upon the sins of Egypt, here is judgment upon the sins of the world. Instead of a temporary salvation provided by the blood of an earthly lamb, this is an eternal salvation accomplished by Jesus, the heavenly Lamb of God. The miraculous arrival of sudden darkness was an act of the Father, indicating a time of judgment and woe. It's meant to bring about feelings of fear and guilt and mourning for those who experience it. Amos chapter 8 verse 9 says, And on that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like the morning for an only sun and the end of it like a bitter day. You can imagine it. Sudden darkness, complete darkness in the middle of the day. This is going to be a little bit more than a total eclipse. We're going to experience that here in April. This is the sun going completely dark. It says in Amos 8, 9, And on that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. A darkness which is meant to communicate to those who are present that God's presence has come, that judgment has arrived, and this is a time of mourning. This darkness, however, was about more than just striking fear and mourning in the hearts of the people. Again, this is an expression of God's judgment, not judgment which would be poured out upon the people, but judgment that would be poured out upon His own Son. And this now is where we find the divine purpose of the cross. This is why I say that as much as Christ suffered at the hands of people, 
we understand the divine purpose of the cross was that God himself would pour suffering out upon his son so that we could go free. Although it was sinful men who crucified Jesus, God the Father was at work. God the Father here is working salvation for all of mankind. Peter in Acts chapter 2, preaching to thousands, said, Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. This is God's plan. This is God the Father's working. This has been in the plan of God since before the foundation of the world. In Acts 4, also when the disciples pray, they say, Lord, all of this has happened, Acts 4.28, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. So the point is this, God the Father is at work in these three hours. He's placing upon Jesus the sin and guilt of the world. He is pouring out judgment in the midst of the darkness. It's in these three three hours of darkness that the events of Isaiah 53 took place. That passage that Andre read for us earlier. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. That speaks of the resurrection. He's going to die, but then he's going to rise. His days will be prolonged even after his death. And he's even going to see offspring. This is the will of the Lord. Uh, The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He's going to accomplish something through his death. Whatever it is that Yahweh seeks to do, this one, Jesus Christ, will accomplish through his death. Verse 11, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. In some way, through the substitutionary death of this servant of the Lord, others will be made righteous by virtue of his substitutionary death. This is what it's saying hundreds of years before the crucifixion of Christ. It says, he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, as a consequence of this substitutionary atonement, whereby the servant of the Lord presents himself as a substitute, it says, therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. He shall divide the spoil with the strong. It's like a great military victory. It's like someone stormed the gates of an enemy, completely decimated that enemy, spoiled them, and took the reward or the bounty as a consequence of that military victory. This is what Christ is doing, but he does what? He storms the gates of hell. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. And so, in the moments when Passover lambs were being slain by the priests, as suitable substitutes for their offerers, Jesus Christ hangs on the cross about to be slain by God as a suitable substitute for all who would believe in him. God the Father is offering his perfect Passover lamb. Perfect without spots and capable of taking away the sins of the world. This lamb, unlike all the other lambs, would be able to bear God's full wrath, thus actually satisfying his righteous requirement, his righteous judgment towards the sins of those for whom Christ died. This is why Paul could say in 1 Corinthians 5, just plainly, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. I'll read you a few passages and suggest to you that these are awesome verses to memorize. 1 Peter 2.24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds you have been healed. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake, he made him to be sin. For our sake, the Father made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin. That in him, we might become the righteousness of God. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. One more, Romans 8.32, God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. What's happening in these three hours of darkness is that God the Father is pouring out His judgment upon His own Son. He's pouring out the just penalty for the sins of you and I. Jesus Christ is the Passover lamb, the sin offering, the scapegoat, the perfect fulfillment of the entire sacrificial system is bearing the full wrath of God, which your sin and my sin deserves. 
The word which the Bible uses for the satisfying of God's judgment and the turning away of His wrath is the word propitiation. Propitiation. 1 John 4.10 says, And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. God says, My righteous requirement will be satisfied. God is holy, and so all sin will be judged. But He's also merciful and loving. What we said earlier is that God not only sent Jesus to deal with the sin that offends Him, but He also sent Jesus to deal with the sin that oppresses us. And so He says, my righteous requirement will be satisfied, my holy standard will be satisfied, but I will provide the means. Why? Out of love. And so God pours out His wrath, His judgment upon His own Son. God's wrath then is completely spent. Completely spent upon Jesus. His wrath is completely expended. His justice is exercised. His righteousness was perfectly expressed. And propitiation is made. Why? Because God is so merciful towards us in recognition of our own inability and our own unworthiness. So that Romans chapter 3 says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. If you're here tonight, maybe you're not a Christian yet, but you still have this mentality that I'm going to be good enough to satisfy God's holy standard, it's absolutely impossible in and of yourself. That's why in Romans 3 it says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Don't try to keep the law in order to achieve righteousness before God. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For all who believe. So how is it that you can be found righteous before God? Not by your own works, not by your own efforts, not by trying to keep the law, but you can be found righteous before God only by faith in Jesus Christ. For there's no distinction, for all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift. No one gets in by earning, no one gets in by merit, Everyone gets in through the gift of God, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. What about all those sins in the Old Testament? What about all those sins before Christ came? Where's the righteousness of God there? Where's where's the holiness of God there? Well, God was anticipating that perfect timing when he would give his son Christ died, bears the wrath of God, and God says, now you see my righteousness. You see it as I pass judgment upon all the sins of those who would believe in Christ as Christ dies on the cross. So that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You get that? That he may be just, no sin goes unjudged. No one can ever accuse God the Father of being unjust because he allowed some sin to go unjudged. So through Christ, he's managed to be just, judging every sin, and amazingly, the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Through Jesus, those who are sinners can be declared righteous, justified, while at the same time, God remains entirely just in his judgment against sin. That's what Jesus accomplished. That's what only Jesus could accomplish. Then what becomes our boasting? Paul says in Romans 3.27, it's excluded. Who in the world could claim that they have earned their salvation? Well, no one. Boasting is excluded. By what kind of law? By law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So if you're here tonight and you're not yet a Christian, place your faith in Jesus. Embrace him as, and him alone is the only way of salvation. He's the only savior. He's the only one who could both satisfy the just, righteous standard of God and provide a way so that you and I could be justified even while we are sinners. So it's a matter of faith. Place your faith in him and him alone and abandon any effort to attain righteousness by your own works. It's a futile effort. And so these hours of darkness are the hours of Christ's greatest suffering. As he, the sinless one, is counted a sinner by his heavenly Father, he with whom Christ has perfect uninterrupted fellowship, now Jesus cries out and says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
he who is the perfect embodiment of God's holiness is now being treated as the full embodiment of sin. He who deserved the greatest honor and exaltation by the Father is now experiencing what feels to him to be being forsaken by the Father. Yet, even Christ anticipating this suffering in Matthew 26, 39, he prays and says, My Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, this cup of suffering. Nevertheless, he says, not as I will, but as you will. This is Jesus Christ's willing submission to the will of the Father, to give himself for us so that we could be saved. Christ in these hours of darkness is experiencing what it is to be utterly forsaken by God. This explains what happens in Matthew 27, verse 46. It says, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He quotes Psalm 22. Here, Jesus is expressing the utter distress of his soul. Christ absorbed the floggings of the men without lashing back. He received the mocking without retribution. He even endured crucifixion while praying for his attackers. But now experiencing the forsaking of the Father, he cries to the Lord with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The eternal one bore an eternal judgment in three hours of time. The Father placed upon Christ the sins of the world and judged him as a sinner while he was yet without sin. God's full wrath against those sins was again spent upon Jesus. His judgment was satisfied and his wrath was turned away. So Romans chapter 5 verse 6 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Is that your testimony tonight? I know it is, if you're saved. It's while you were still a sinner, while you were still wandering, while you were still wholly unable and unworthy, that's when Christ saved you. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Stuart Townend captures this moment in his song, How Deep the Father's Love, which we sang earlier. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. God then is perfectly satisfied, and look what it says in verse 42. It says, while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. The curtain in the temple was torn in two. God's signaling something here, obviously. This is a divine act whereby he tears the veil in the temple. This is the centerpiece of Jewish worship, the temple. Do you know the layout of the temple between the walls of the temple, beyond the courtyard, past the altars to the holy place? Within the holy place was the holiest of holies. The first feature of the altar of incense and the table of showbread. And beyond that room was a veil, a thick curtain, 60 feet high, 30 feet wide. Beyond that veil, again, the most holy place. There in the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seats. It was here where the very presence of God would descend in the midst of Israel. He was within the most holy place that only the high priest could pass into, and even then, only once a year. And even then, he had to come bearing the blood of a sin offering. No one entered in except the priest, and even then, he had to come with blood, and even then, once a year, that veil that is torn here as darkness descends upon the earth symbolized the reality that there was a division between man and God, that God in his holiness was unapproachable by sinful men. That's what it symbolized. There forever existed between God and men division, enmity. Yet the offering of the blood of Jesus Christ did what? It tore that veil from top to bottom. That's a divine act. It wasn't from the bottom to the top. It wasn't as if men could do it from the bottom to the top. This is God's uh, sovereign act whereby he symbolizes that the way now has been made into the presence of God. 
Since Jesus satisfied the wrath of God and made atonement for our sin, he's made it possible for those who believe in him to actually enter into the presence of God. Hebrews emphasizes this in chapter 10, verse 19. It says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. Who is that? That's brothers. That's everyone. It's not the high priest coming with the blood once a year, but it's all of us. Everyone who names the name of Jesus Christ can come into the presence of God. Why? Because we've slaughtered a lamb? No, but because we can claim the blood of Jesus by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Every time you come to God the Father, every time you benefit from a relationship with God the Father, every time you come to him in prayer, you are coming because the veil has been split from top to bottom, because Jesus made the way, because the wrath of God has been satisfied. Jesus, once and for all and forever, bore the wrath of God towards the sins of all who would believe in him, and so the veil is torn. Christ's sacrifice is accepted. God's wrath is satisfied. The way into his presence has been made. And what else? Well, the temple, the sacrificial system is obsolete. Along with the power and the influence of the hypocritical religious crowd, Jesus, frankly, just robbed them of all their power and influence. And then John records for us at this time, the veil is split. I mean, it's accomplished, it's done, it's not going to be sewn back together, it's over. Now, the temple's going to continue for some years, the sacrificial system is going to continue for some time, but God's presence isn't there, it's not effective in any way. The veil's been torn. It's recorded in John that at this time, Jesus cries out, it is finished, it is finished. And then in our passage, in verse 46, it says, Jesus calling out with a loud voice said, Father... Into your hands I commit my spirits. And having, said this, and having said this, he breathed his last. Jesus is in control of his own life. He lays it down. He can take it up again. After he's borne the wrath of God and accomplished all that the Father sent him to do, he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And note the tenderness there. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It seems to me that that time of feeling forsaken by the Father has passed. Jesus bore the wrath of God towards the sins of all who would believe in him in that moment of time. He bore it. Father, why have you forsaken me? But now, Father, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The tender, intimate fellowship with the Father and the Son that has been enjoyed from all of eternity is expressed in those words. In verse 46, And having said this, he breathed his last. And with that, Jesus is dead. Jesus is dead. He's dead, but he is victorious. This is what we saw in Isaiah 53. He's accomplished all that he came to do. Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. John 12, verse 27 says, Now is my soul troubled. And again, he says, What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Jesus lived a perfect life. Jesus fulfilled the law. Jesus suffered at the hands of sinful men. Jesus bore the wrath of God. The result, God's wrath has been satisfied. The way into his presence has been made. Sin can be freely forgiven once and for all and forever. Last passage we're going to read and we're done. We just ask this question. We know what Jesus accomplished on the cross. We know what was happening when, the, when those three hours of darkness descended. This is God's judgment, his wrath. This is a time of mourning for an only son. But we know what Jesus accomplished. So the question now is this. Whose sins now are forgiven? Who now benefits from what Jesus accomplished on the cross? I'm going to suggest to you tonight that if you have not yet come to Christ and embraced him as your Savior and Lord, This can be you. John 3.14 says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Thus speaking of his crucifixion. That whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And now in verse 18, there's a whoever. Whoever. 
Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever? Anyone? What's the condition? Well, whoever believes. Whoever believes. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Why? Well, because he's already been condemned. Christ has been condemned for the sins of those who believe, so then those who believe will not be condemned. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever did not believe is condemned already. You're still in your sins. You still must bear the penalty for your own sin uh, because you have not placed your faith in Christ because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And so, it's Good Friday. This is a time to remember both the incredible depths of the love of God for us, even while we are still in our sin. This is a time to reflect upon the incomparable sacrifice which Christ has made as an expression of love for us. Further, it's a time to be reminded that if we believed in Jesus, our sin debt has been entirely paid. God is satisfied. Your sin is forgiven. You have peace with the Father. You have been ushered into relationship with Him. And again, just tonight, if you have not yet trusted Christ and Christ alone is your Savior and Lord, you can be assured that if you believe in Jesus as the Son of God this evening, the one who fulfilled the law, who bore your sins and satisfied the wrath of God on your behalf, then the way into the presence of God has been made for you too. Christ gave himself for us so that he could bring us to God. And so just like that criminal who's hanging next to Jesus in the last moments of his life, God shedding his grace upon him for that divine appointment, arranging it so that he's next to the Savior of the world as he's uttering his last breaths. It may very well be that God has also arranged this divine appointment where you're here tonight hearing the gospel, inviting you to this, this, the same invitation that he's offered to this criminal. Believe in him, and what? You can have the assurance that when the time comes for you, that you'll find yourself in the presence of God with Christ. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for Jesus. And tonight we confess as believers that we were wholly unable to save ourselves. We were entirely unworthy of salvation. And you saved us while we were in that state. And so... Just as we came to you with nothing in our hand, just as we came to you renouncing our own righteousness and our own goodness, so tonight we continue living before you, confessing that our worth is not our own, that we remain unworthy in and of ourselves, that we remain unable in and of ourselves. But any goodness we now have is a product of Christ in us, your Holy Spirit. We now know that we can please you by your Holy Spirit. We know that we can fulfill the righteous requirement of the law when we walk according to the Spirit. But this is all your doing, all your work. So help us not to fall into the trap of legalism. Help us not to lean again on our own power, but to be wholly dependent upon Christ. I pray in these moments that you would help us to reflect and to pray that Christ would be valuable in our sight, that he'd be precious to us. And we pray tonight for any who are here who are not yet Christians, pray that they place their faith in Jesus. Pray that the scriptures that we read that make it abundantly clear that salvation is by grace through faith and not by works, I pray that you would allow these truths to penetrate the heart. And we pray that you would save some. And we pray that they would prove the genuineness of their faith by walking as your disciples. Lord, we thank you for all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.